So joining our series on this episode is Jerry Ryan, OAM, revered businessman and Australian manufacturing icon, whose business interests now extend beyond not only the Jayco Australia Empire he established in 1975, but also now incorporates wineries, resorts and sporting teams, to name a few, with revenues generated in excess of $500 million per annum. Jerry, pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. I, I thought we'd open up with the current environment. I want to get an understanding of what you're seeing in the in the market at the moment. Well, it's been a tough couple of years, and you know, Victoria's had more lockdowns than everywhere else. But it's not just here in Australia, but uh, worldwide, the, the issue is um, people. There's full employment. Uh, America, uh, Europe have the same problems. Uh, a, with uh, absenteeism due to COVID, uh, tested positive or isolation. Um, but uh, supply is a big issue, people and supply. Uh, so hopefully we come into 22, we've been disrupted already. Hopefully uh, it's going to ease in the next few months. And, uh, but we are short of people. I want to ask you about that staff shortage. There's a big sign as you drive into Jayco Drive here that you're advertising for both full-time and part-time staffing positions. How are you managing to navigate that staff shortage given you've got some 13 or 1400 staff working here each day? Well, we've seen a, a change in people's attitude since uh, COVID, or well, still with us, but uh, and, and people have reflected on their, their, their work life, their balance of uh, personal life and uh, I think you'll see a lot of movement uh, in management and other people uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, without immigration the last um, two years and certainly the visas, the students coming out on the two year visas, we are missing them uh, across the board, especially in hospitality and, and uh, in rural areas for fruit picking and, uh, and grape picking and the likes. You've got your fingers in multiple different pies. What do you see are the opportunities ahead for 2022? Well, it's a great opportunity. Out of every crisis comes opportunity, but but also uh, coming out of COVID uh, certainly got us issues, as I said, people and uh, supply. So um, where are the opportunities? There's opportunities in all industries. You know, you talk about IT, online businesses, um, tourism, uh, hospitality building. We're an industrial building builders and uh, it's busy. Uh, as soon as you put up a, a shed or a warehouse, someone's got a for lease sign or it's sold. So. You've been involved in domestic manufacturing for many decades now. I'd be interested to get an understanding of how you've been able to ensure that you're a competitive business manufacturing in Australia when the costs are so high, the labour costs are so high relative to other markets. Well, you know, what, what we continually do uh, is innovation um, and continuous improvement. What we're trying to do is improve the efficiency if we can, we can then put, pay higher wages. And I think higher wages come about by innovation and continuous improvement. We benchmark ourselves uh, on internally. Um, we have a lot of trades, but we also uh, get uh, outside contractors to quote. And if they can do it more efficiently than uh, Jayco, we, we uh, palm it out. From a global perspective, how would you assess Australia's competitive position and what reforms or policies would you like to see implemented? Well, we need immigration. There's no doubt uh, there is a shortage of uh, uh, staff, uh, skilled and semi-skilled staff. So number one, immigration. Um, get the, the visas, uh, student visas going again. But I think that we have to address a national uh, eco training system. So one that uh, identify the trades and that information is available where the shortages are. And so do it on a national basis, do it quicker, and uh, it would be more efficient um, doing it. So we can't grow unless our people grow. Um, and that's in numbers and their skill sets. Uh, then we can, we can compete uh, against the rest of the world. Before we move on, I'd be interested to get a gauge on how you're managing to navigate the supply chain issues in Australia and, and that are affecting global markets at the moment. How are you managing to get components or chips 
into Australia and into the factory here? Well, you know, early days, um, I've learned a lesson that it's so important people in business, and not just the people in your business, but also to look at uh, relationships outside your business, your suppliers, uh, your, your customers, and it's critical that you keep uh, a good relationship because they'll stick with you long term. So we communicate with our suppliers, our, our long term. We go out 12 months and every quarter and then every 30 days. But we're now looking to, uh, we've got orders out of their suppliers in China and America and Italy out to uh, 23. They can produce, but the biggest problem, uh, they can't ship. So once again, having a very good relationship with a shipping company that uh, tries to find containers for us, more importantly, to get trucks in, in, in America and even in China, having enough truck drivers and the same case in, here in Australia. So uh, it's so important that uh, relationships and when you've got to call on people, they're there to support you. I want to change topics and briefly explore your background. As I understand it, you grew up in Bendigo. Talk to me about your childhood and, and where the interest in business came about from. Well, um, I grew up in a family of nine children, uh, very humble beginnings, but uh, you know we, we didn't have a lot, but uh, we had encouraging, loving parents, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, my first business, where did I get interest in business? Um, well. The first business, I was 12, uh, selling newspapers. And what I worked it out, that I'd get the papers, go out and try and sell all. If not, I'd have to return some and have to pay X amount for the papers. What was left over um, was mine. That was a profit. So uh, that was my first business. But you know, I don't know when I actually, uh, uh, the penny dropped, that I wanted to be in business. I uh, uh, wasn't very good at school. I started studying accountancy part-time, uh, got a cadetship at AMP, but uh, unfortunately uh, I, the lecturer after the first term said, uh, Jerry, you're wasting your time and my time. So uh, I uh, then focused, I was working property in their property department at AMP and learned a little bit about property. Then I was heading to the west. Uh, my brother was a civil engineer banking, back in 72, making big money. So I was going to head over there and someone said, oh, I was waiting around for three months and uh, uh, I got a job on the line in a, a Sunwagon camper trailers. And uh, after three months, they made me a foreman. Six months at 22, I was manager, production manager, running about 100 people. So, uh, I got into management at that stage. Never did I think I was, I was going to go into uh, start a business. They had the opportunity uh, to go to a company that was supplying components to Sunwagon. The company was called Jayco. So, uh, you know, I'd met the owners. They'd been out here before and uh, struck up a relationship over two and a half weeks of looking at how they were produced and how they were shipped and spent some time in their R&D department. Came back, I was 23 at the time, and two companies had merged and uh, I got pushed to the side. And uh, what did the Yanks know? Uh, you know, probably a little young upstart uh, saying, hey, why don't we do it this way, that way? And uh, they didn't want to listen. So I'd become friends with the the marketing manager, and so I'd go out weekends and learn a bit about the sales side and uh, have my lunch with the purchasing manager, supply manager, and uh, learn you know, what purchasing is all about. So 12 months later, I decided to have a crack and uh, I um, borrowed 10,000 and, uh, and I was green. I don't know how, but we got the first prototype uh, that was in August of 75, had the prototype finished and uh, by about uh, October and leased a factory in their production line. First unit rolled off in, in January 76. And if I recall correctly, in the company's first full trading year, you delivered close to 480 units. 
What were the fundamentals that you learned during that stage that, that were able to make the business so successful in its first year and, and onwards? The first year, our biggest dealership went bust. So owing about $60,000 and uh, but more importantly, the lack of sales going forward. But uh, you know, it took me a few years to understand. It was a, it was a totally different environment back then, uh, how to do business. And uh, not only was I naive, but the people I was working with uh, in terms of, um, of, of what you really need to do as a business. So it took me a few years to realise that people were your number one asset. Fast forward to today and the JCO Australia business now produces some 13 or 14,000 units per year with a workforce, as I mentioned, of some 1,400 staff. I'd be interested to hear how you managed to grow the business year on year despite economic volatility. We've only ever went through a stage, and it was during the recession, uh, that we had to have and that we've had to lay people off uh, during COVID last year. Uh, the previous year, we did have to lay some people off, but you know, I can chart. I can chart uh, our growth. It comes back to myself um, in, in terms of where my belief and the vision is for the business. But it always starts at the top, and you know, if it's a private company, the owners. If it's a public company, it's, it's a board. So, um, you know, it's been a valuable lesson. You know, as I said, people. But uh, the most important is cash flow. Um, I get reports on a daily basis from the businesses, you know, where they're at in terms of orders, output, uh, and more importantly, uh, how much money you've got in the bank and, and how much is owed to you. To what extent has the Australian consumer market changed and matured throughout the course of the past 40 odd years? And how has Jayco as a business adapted to those changing needs? For a start, it has changed. When we first started uh, in, the, in the business, it was a holiday market, right? There was the families going holiday. Then we saw a, a new generation of retirees coming in, and today, more of an adventure, people wanting to go and explore the great outdoors, off the grid, go camping in the bush, not in caravan parks. So there's three distinct markets. But Today, uh, as we saw the retirees come in, well, they wanted the comforts. They wanted air conditioning, showers, TVs, uh, slide out barbecues, uh, electric awnings. Um, the consumer certainly, and it's in all businesses today, and the internet's done that, it, they're more uh, educated and more demanding of uh, what they want, and they have the money to do it. If I recall correctly, Jayco has around about a 45 or 50 per cent market share. How have you been able to make sure that the business is not only competitive but a real market leader, given that other competitors have arisen over the past 30 or 40 years? Well, innovation's number one, <coughs> and efficiency. So, you know, where we buy, you know, for, you know, well, next year, this, this next financial year, it'll be 15,000 know, units. So we've got volume. Our next competitor has probably got about 2,500. So we're more efficient at, at building, uh, more efficient at buying, and innovation. We've got the equipment that they can't afford to put in that uh, takes a lot of uh, labour out of it. Uh, so it's more efficient um, cost-wise. But uh, you know, our market uh, or our competition is going to be the Chinese because they can um, bring product in in, uh, in a matter of uh, six to ten weeks where if you want to order a Jayco it's 12 months. That's uh, the, the problem that not only Jayco but the industry is facing in the next 12 months. Reflecting on, your, on the management style that you did employ when you were working on the business day to day, you mentioned off air that basically you, know, you enjoy working on the factory floor, you enjoy talking to the people on the factory floor rather than being stuck in boardrooms. What, why, why has that been so successful for you, do you think? I, I think that it's just my belief that everyone is, is equal in an organisation and everyone has a part to play if it's a, a sporting team or a business, and you've got to communicate. Uh, I still go down and check the waste bins out and, uh, and 
a couple of staff say, oh, here's a couple of dollars if you're looking for some um, uh, lunch money, Jerry. But the fact is I'm demonstrating that the waste factor, you know, we've got $8 million worth of waste. Well, if we can get that down to $4 million, right, I can then share the rewards with the staff. And it's important that the awareness of, uh, of efficiency, waste, um, and the biggest waste is time. And I'm, I'm one, when I came back uh, a couple of years ago to, to do some reshuffling at JCO, the first thing I looked at, unnecessary activities. Reports that are 10 pages and no one, no one reads them. So first meeting, pair of scissors, cut the reports up, right? And some egg timers on the table. You know, meetings that you know can take half an hour, I'm dragging out to an hour. I even went to one extent to take chairs out of a meeting room. They're not going to stand around for an hour. They might sit for an hour, but it's just the the one percent is an awareness. And as I said, unnecessary activity. And the word I use is why. Why? Why do we do it? You know, why is the, the consumer not buying our products? Um, and uh, why, why, why? It would seem that that's filtered down throughout the company. It's a, it's a culture where staff seem to enjoy working here, where some of the measures that you've implemented over recent years or, or really since the beginning, including celebrating staff birthdays, taking them out for lunch at the end of the year, all that sort of thing. Why is that so important to you? Well, you know, I always say the Jayco family, it's not just Jayco, whatever business I'm in, involved in. And it, it's, it's to family, to make sure that we look after the welfare of our people and a, a sense of belonging for them. In 2015, you stepped down from day-to-day -day management of the company after being intricately involved for over four decades. Talk to me about how you see the next phase of growth for the business and how you've managed succession planning. Well, the, the business will continue, the, the industry will con continue to grow. Um, people discovering that we're seeing new people coming into the industry that uh, have never been in it. Motorised, that's um, a big market, and uh, especially the camper van, the drivable ones, that, uh, it's a second vehicle. Uh, it's a very big growth market. The outdoor market, the off-road vehicles, um, you know, huge potential in that area. People, uh, the whole leisure industry will continue to grow. Before we move on, talk to me about what you see are the biggest achievements in regards to the JCO journey. Well, the biggest achievement uh, is being in business for 46 years. It's, it's not easy. And to try and maintain the passion for the people and the people in the business, um, maintain that passion because without passion, without people sharing the vision, um, it doesn't happen, right, regardless. So that's number one. The biggest joy is to see uh, people that come through the ranks. We spend a lot of money on developing people and um, you know, to see them grow. They've started off the factory floor, and now they're the manufacturing manager. Um, and there's various stories about the management team and uh, where they've come from. We've explored Jayco as a business, but that's really only sort of one part of your professional career. You also co-founded the Mitchelton Scott or Team Bike Exchange team as it's known now, professional cycling team. How have you seen the success of that team given the enormous financial contributions that you've made? Well, once again, it's like a lot of other things, people come to me uh, with an idea and. I first got involved in cycling back in uh, 92. I gave Cathy, what, $10,000 to go and ride and, um, and train in the uh, altitude um, in the Rockies before the Barcelona Olympics. So she won gold and I thought, how good is this? So I formed a cycling team back then and uh, it was winning everything. It was on the local competition and uh, US at road. And uh, so I got behind cycling and uh, I used to go to the Tour de France, Cadell Evans and, uh, and Simon Gerrans and uh, cheer from the sidelines. And sitting in Paris one day, I, you know, I thought, there's French cars, team cars was French, uh, English, uh, American, German. It's about time an Australian flag was on one of the cars. So uh, I thought it'd be easy 
that it took two years to put together and uh, it's been a great journey and uh, you know a lot of people have enjoyed uh, watching Green Edge uh, over the years on and off the bike and uh, more importantly I've given some Australian talent a pathway to success um, on the world cycling stage. And do you still get over to the Tour de France most years, notwithstanding the, the challenges of the past 24 months, but do you still go and do you still get a thrill out of seeing your team there? Yeah, I do. And uh, I was in Adelaide uh, uh, last week, first time I've seen you know, most of the guys for two and a half years, and uh, um, it certainly gave me a buzz. So it doesn't matter if it's Adelaide or, or uh, France or uh, Italy, um, it's great, great stage. You're also the force behind the highly popular uh, Mitchelton Mines business, which you purchased, I think, in around about 2011, and have grown alongside your son, Andrew Ryan, to become one of the state's premier destinations. Take me through the opportunity that you saw back in 2011 or 2012, and then how has that business grown over the years? Yeah, I, I set up uh, uh, on the farm. I had a farm at Nagambi, uh, trying to grow a couple of horses, uh, fast horses. And uh, anyway, I was approached, uh, could I take over the winery? always admired the property as um, what a great real estate play and then uh, when we got in uh, had a look around it was tired unloved but more importantly the people in there believed in in the brand and the property so we set about uh, after having to jump a lot of hurdles to uh, get planning approval um, put a uh, 58 room hotel, day spa, uh, indigenous art gallery, one probably one of the largest commercial ones in Australia. And I've added a cafe and uh, yeah, it, it's a, a property I'm very proud of and uh, Andrew's done a great job. And, uh, and I happen to have a house now next door uh, where I'm still trying to uh, grow some uh, fast racehorses. And what's the, where did the love affair with Nagambi as a region arise from? Well, I started out uh, going back nearly 20 years ago. I started looking for a property. I had a few brood mares to do, and it was be fast becoming a thoroughbred centre. Uh, Rick Jamison, Adam Sangster, and Darley had just moved in. So, um, out of horses, and uh, it's just a quaint uh, area on the river. Some great gum trees to sit and watch, and uh, yeah, pretty special. Speaking of horses, you've had three Melbourne Cup winners commencing in 2010 with Americane and then rekindling in 2017 alongside Lloyd Williams and then most recently Twilight Payment in 2020. Walk me through what it's like being a Melbourne Cup winner. Well, going back to the start, I said we grew up from very humble beginnings. I used to jump the uh, fence at the Bendigo Jockey Club uh, track and um, never ever dreamt that I'd have a runner in a Melbourne Cup, let alone a winner. So for a few years we tried before uh, a Mary Kane, uh, Kevin Bamford and myself and uh, the big day came and a lot of excitement and the build up and uh, yeah and I still pinch myself to say hey uh, how special it was and to go back uh, and do it again uh, and the third time and but it's always the journey, it's about the people you do it with and um, you know, I've been blessed to have uh, had that journey. I want to ask you about Global Creatures, the entertainment company you chair which launched in 2004 with seed funding of 150000 and has since grown to turn over hundreds of millions of dollars from a number of different stage shows. Walk me through the Global Creatures venture and how you became involved. Well it's another, you know, why did you do it Jerry? But Billy May approached me uh, for 150,000 seed capital to uh, build a dinosaur. Uh, he approached BBC to get the rights. BBC are looking to expand and see where they can get revenue on some of their brands. Uh, a great brand, Walking with Dinosaurs. So that 150 turned into 250, which turned into, it was going to be four mil, turned into nine mil. I don't know how, but we um, finally got 19 dinosaurs to Sydney and to opening night. But in the meantime, that we'd, we'd put together a lot of talented people. Um, 
And some of these people uh, you know, go from one job to another, might and work in the industry for 12 months. So I said, I can't let it go. So we decided to build a second set. So we had two sets running around the world and at the time uh, I was having a, a little bit of trouble with some of the management of handling it and uh, I approached um, someone to uh, come in and, uh, and uh, take it on and uh, Carmen uh, said, hey, I'll come and work for you if you do King Kong. So yeah, I said yes. So, yeah. And uh, so Carmen came on, uh, and came on board. We did, um, she brought Warhorse. We went and got the rights for Milan Rouge and Strictly Ballroom and uh, Mirrell's Wedding. Uh, and naturally we did King Kong. Um, so the dinosaurs were still traveling around the world, the workshop, had grown uh, to 100 people and were doing work for Universal Studios. So we had two businesses, one in theatre, one in, in engineering in a sense, manufacturing. And uh, so uh, it, it's been a success. It doesn't come overnight. Nothing does. Um, we are now the world's best animatronic business manufacturer in the world. Uh, and we've won awards for it. and a Tony Award uh, for King Kong. And then on the theatre side, uh, we probably have one of the hottest shows, uh, second to Hamilton, in the world. Um, we're currently in New York, uh, West End, um, Melbourne, uh, Germany in November, and uh, Korea in uh, December. So, uh, you know, but once again, it's all about people. And Sonny Tilders, uh, you know, on the creature technology side, uh, so once again, I've been very blessed that uh, surround yourself with good people to make you look good. So, it must be said, you're also involved in online retail through a number of different platforms. Just Campers being one, and there's several others. I'd be interested to, and Bike Exchange, of course, being one of the most prominent ones. I'd be interested to hear about what you enjoy about being involved in online retail and how you see that landscape change. Once again, I, you know, I start things and then allow people to move over. But once again, the right people, you know, I'm not a tech person, far from it. I tell people I'm an old dinosaur and I build dinosaurs, right? So, um, but once again, it's the people. I've stepped away from those businesses because I, sometimes, you know, I, I'm not at their level of, of uh, intellect. Uh, and um, uh, it doesn't move fast enough for me. Uh, you've got to be very patient uh, in, in being involved in IT. I thought we'd close out our discussion just by exploring your perspective on a couple of broader topics. Firstly, you've previously mentioned the need to be nimble and responsive to market demand. Walk me through how you've achieved this throughout your business career. I always say it's not the big, it'll be the small, it's the fast will beat the snow and you have to be nimble. The more layers of in an organisation you, you have, the slower the message or the clarity of the message uh, um, gets uh, lost. So once again, uh, try and keep the silos out, out of businesses, make sure everyone's talking uh, and make sure everyone understands the vision, more importantly, the goals. I always say to, uh, you know, it's Mondays to set up the week, um, and it's the week that set up the months, and the months that set up the quarters and the quarters of the year. So you've got to make sure you prioritise and um, try and achieve those uh, priorities and the A's, get them done. The B's, when you finish the A's and forget about the C's, they'll fall off the table. Reflecting on your career, what would you say are the secrets to success? People, you know, and I haven't always got the people side, the side right, but, um, you know, and, and relationships. What do you see the growth industries of the future and are there any sectors that you're not currently invested in but that you're closely analysing? Certainly not. Uh, you, you take IT, there's, there's no doubt, and the world's changing very quickly there. You know, tourism, uh, hospitality, um, building, 
if we open the gates to immigration, we'll need more houses, uh, warehousing, you know, the whole model of retail's moved to warehousing. You can't go past food, as we're always going to eat and we're always going to have a drink. The world is changing, uh, you've just got to change with it. I want to ask you about two beloved Melbourne clubs. Firstly, the NRL club, the Melbourne Storm, and then the AFL club, the St Kilda Saints. How do you think both of those clubs will fare this year? Well, Storm, I'll take the Storm, probably, uh, they not got, lost their hunger late in, you know, uh, late in the season. It came all too easy to them, uh, the easy wins, and then when the pressure came on, they really didn't know how to react and probably weren't hungry enough. Uh, but uh, Craig Bellamy is one of the best coaches. Uh, they've identified the issues. We've lost a couple of players, but Melbourne have got some depth and, uh, uh, and will continue to be successful this year and has got every chance to uh, win a premiership. Saints, they've certainly, uh, over the last few years, got themselves out of debt and in a far better position. Um, better managed today than what they were and it's pretty hard when you've got a heap of debt and uh, you're trying to field a football team and you know build that stadium down at, um, well not stadium but uh, the facilities down at uh, Moorabbin which was you know always the home of the Saints and uh, a couple of players short of uh, a premiership, in fact probably half a dozen and I always say that it's about list management uh, in football or cycling or even in business. Look at who's coming through. Um, and uh, my little exercise at, at uh, the end of the season was to get Melbourne's premiership team, get St Kilda's list of players and see how many players would get into the Melbourne side and then pick a side that uh, is going to beat Melbourne. We're probably six players short of a premiership. How do you spend your week? Depending. Uh, I might be here Monday, Tuesday at Jacob because there's a base. Uh, we've got an office in Richmond, but um, it takes as much time to get to Richmond as does Danny Nong. Wednesdays normally lunch days were for mates. Thursday I'll go and visit a few businesses and Friday I'm chasing cattle or, or um, feeding some horses and relaxing up in the Gamby. Second last question, there's been opportunities presented to you to list the JCO business. You've preferred to keep it in private hands. Why is that? Well, a few of my mates have uh, been the private uh, road for a long time and, gone, and others have gone public. Um, you go public if you need capital. Um, you know, the group um, this year will be uh, close to a, a billion dollars if we can get the production, or it certainly will be next year. Uh, we've got a good cash flow. Um, and while I can still manage and drop in, uh, uh, I'll keep doing it. My final question is, what does the next chapter look like for Jerry Ryan? Enjoying what I've got, and more importantly, enjoying my grandchildren, and spending time with them, um, and doing special things. Jerry Ryan, OAM, absolute pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. Thanks so much for your time. Not a problem.